Hi again, I want to talk to you today about how God works all things together for good. We've all heard this before from Romans chapter 8, where it tells us God works all things together for good. But really, do we understand this? Because this tells explains a lot. It explains a lot of things of why things happen in the Bible. I got some responses from my last week's video on how Christians should not be debating between each other. And I heard some people say, oh, well, see, they, they debated in the New Testament times, in the early church, they debated, and it was a good thing. No, it wasn't a good thing. They were breaking the Word of God. They were absolutely disobeying the Word of God, which says, do all things without arguing or complaining. We're not supposed to argue or complain. That's not what we're supposed to do. God worked it together for good when people disputed. God never caused people to dispute in order to accomplish something. God never forced someone to sin in order to accomplish something. God doesn't do that. God's not a manipulator. Satan is the manipulator, and God is always working for good. So we're going to take a look at how God works all things together for good. In Romans chapter 8 here, we see in verse 28, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, to them that love God. So for Christians, all Christians are included in this. Christians are people that love God. And then it reiterates this by saying to them that are called according to his purpose. Well, people say, oh, well, there are Christians who are not a called according to God's purpose. No, every Christian is called according to God's purpose. Remember, God invited everyone to believe in Jesus Christ and get saved. God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. First Timothy 2, 4. So if we go back to chapter 1 and verse 7. He's writing to the church and he says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. This is the same word called that is used in chapter 8, verse 28. To all in, that be in Rome, all the Christians who are loved of God, called to be saints. So he's writing to the church and he's telling them that they are called. And in chapter 8, and verse 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So he's talking about all Christians. All things work together for good to them that love God. That's Christians. To them that are the called according to his purpose. That is Christians. Now we see this in a very obvious manner in the very fact that Jesus died and rose again. If we go back to chapter 5 of Romans, in verse 6, it says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. If we look at this in the NIV, it says it a little better. It says, you see, at just the right time, when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, this is God working something together for good that is the most basic thing in all the world. The idea that man fell in the Garden of Eden. Man needed salvation. So what did God do? God sent Jesus Christ to die for us and take all our sins. Verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's God demonstrating his love for us. God knew beforehand that they were going to kill him. Why? At just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God sent Jesus at just the right time. Remember Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25, where Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. So God is never on Satan's side, and Satan is never on God's side. These two kingdoms are not divided against themselves. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. In verse 26, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall his kingdom stand? So we know that Satan's not divided against himself and God's not divided against himself. Satan was trying to destroy the seed of the woman that would bring salvation to the world and also cause his downfall. And God was bringing the seed of the woman into the world by sending Jesus. And the seed of the woman was for the salvation of the world. So we see in Luke Chapter 22, starting at verse 2, And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, 
Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, being a number of the 12. This is how Satan always works. He infiltrates. He infiltrates the good and tries to bring evil in. So Satan entered into Judas named Iscariot. In other words, Judas gave Satan a foothold. God didn't want Judas to give Satan a foothold, but he knew beforehand that he would. Because once again, remember, God is outside of time. God created time. There was an evening and there was morning the first day. So God actually created days. God created time. So God's outside of time. He knew what Judas Iscariot would do if he sent Jesus at just this time. So Satan entered into Judas Iscariot because Judas gave Satan a foothold. That's why it says in Ephesians 4.27, don't give the devil a foothold because he doesn't have one unless you give it to him. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. So when Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, Judas Iscariot, that was the vehicle Satan used. He tried to figure out how he might betray Jesus. And they were glad and coveted. They promised to give Judas money to betray Jesus. And then we see when Jesus was actually betrayed, we see that on that very night, Satan entered Judas Iscariot. In John chapter 13, starting in verse 21, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily I say to you that one of you shall betray me. Now, was it a good thing for someone to betray Jesus? Was Judas doing a good thing by betraying Jesus? No, God works all things together for good for those who love him. Well, what happened because Judas betrayed Jesus Christ? What happened? Salvation for the whole world happened. Was it God's desire that Judas do this evil thing and betray Jesus? And Judas ends up committing suicide? Was that God's will? Of course not. But God knew that Judas would do this because he's outside of time and he knew this was going to happen. Judas acted on his own free will. So Jesus, he said, one of them, one of you shall betray me. And when Simon Peter wanted to know, he asked John to ask Jesus who he's talking about, who's going to betray him. Then John asked Jesus, he said, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is the one whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, who entered him? Satan entered into him. Now, was it God's will that Judas Iscariot give the devil a foothold? No, he, he commanded us, don't give the devil a foothold. Jesus was an innocent man who Judas Iscariot plotted to betray. That's never right. That's never a good thing. Jesus was an innocent man. Judas Iscariot was betraying him. That's never right. God doesn't change. God didn't want Judas Iscariot to give the devil a foothold, but he knew that he would because, he, once again, God's outside of time. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. In other words, Judas had given the devil a foothold. And once again, we saw that Satan entered into him when he went to figure out a way to betray Jesus. Now Satan enters into him again, right? When he betrays Jesus. And what happens after that? Verse 28, what you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. Now that means Jesus knew already what Judas Iscariot was going to do. So people say, oh, see, it was God's will that Judas betrayed Jesus. No, it wasn't. That was God working all things together for good for those who love him or are called according to his purpose. It wasn't God's will that Judas Iscariot give the devil a foothold. God's kingdom is not divided against itself. God doesn't show favoritism. We know that God doesn't show favoritism of one person over another. No, people make their own free will decisions. So Satan entered into Judas Iscariot because Judas gave the devil a foothold. And Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said to the, this to him. In other words, they didn't fathom the fact that Judas was going to betray Jesus. But Jesus knew this. He told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. He knew he was going to do it. And verse 30, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. Where did he go to betray Jesus? Jesus. So here we see the ultimate of God working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This wasn't God's will that Judas Iscariot give the devil a foothold. Once again, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, and do not give the devil a foothold. Is that true or isn't it? Well, Judas obviously gave the devil a foothold. He was not doing this. He was going against the word of God. He was giving the devil a foothold. 
He was betraying an innocent man. It was the worst kind of betrayal and resulted in the death of Jesus Christ. Now, God worked that together for good because Romans chapter 3 tells us what happened as a result of that. Verse 21, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. So people say, oh, see, God presented him as a sacrifice. So Judas was acting on God's behalf. No, no, God knew what Judas would do beforehand because God is outside of time. So God allowed Jesus to be sacrificed and Jesus knew he was going to be sacrificed because they both knew, God the Father and Jesus the Son both knew that Judas Iscariot was going to betray him. So God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Talk about working together for good. This is the ultimate of working together for good. They killed Jesus. Satan killed Jesus. Satan was behind Jesus being betrayed and being handed over to the chief priests in the first place. Satan was behind that. And God worked it together for good. He brought salvation to the whole world. 1 John 2.2 2 tells us that he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, talking to Christians, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So when Jesus was killed... After Judas Iscariot betrayed him, Jesus became the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world, so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Once again, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It tells us he that believes in Jesus is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So salvation was brought to the whole world for whoever would believe in Jesus because Jesus died on the cross. And that was actually carried out by Satan. And Judas Iscariot was a pawn of Satan when he was doing that. God worked it together for good, knowing beforehand what would happen as a result of sending Jesus. That's why it says he gave his only begotten son because he knew what was going to happen to Jesus and Jesus knew and willingly obeyed and went to the earth to do this for us. And we know what happened at the cross because 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Talking about Jesus, what he did at the cross, he bore our sins in his body on the tree. So Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree and brought salvation to the whole world as a result of what Satan did. Satan was trying to destroy and Jesus brought life through that situation. But let's look at some other cases where God worked things together for good. In Acts chapter 15, we see in verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren that except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, obviously, this is a heresy. Like in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13, You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's the law which was contrary to us, the law was contrary to us, no one ever lived up to it, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So the law was nailed to the cross with Christ. The law was done away with, and only the Jews were ever under the law to begin with. The law was given to the Jews. It was never given to the Gentiles in the first place. So we see in Acts chapter 15, these certain men were absolutely telling a falsehood. This was a heresy. This was a heresy that they were teaching the brethren. Certain men which came down from Judea, they taught a heresy to the brethren. They said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's absolutely false. Verse 2 says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, with them, in other words, Paul and Barnabas saw that this was a heresy. They immediately saw this was a heresy. And they had no small dissension and disputation with them. In other words, they came out of it and said, you guys are absolutely wrong. They disputed this idea because it was such a complete heresy that it was obvious they were wrong. 
So what did they do after this disputation? They wanted to prove this was a heresy. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question to try to get it resolved completely. Now, the ridiculous thing is they didn't need the church in Jerusalem to tell them this was right or wrong. They already had the gospel. We know that we're saved by Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, by Jesus' death. His blood is what saved us. We know already this was utter baloney that these people were teaching that you must be circumcised, that you must obey the law, because when you're circumcised, you had to obey the law under the old covenant. So this is utter baloney here. And Paul and Barnabas knew this, and they immediately had a disputation and dissension with them. Now, hold on a second. Didn't it say in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings? Disputing, do all things. Does that say some things? No, it says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. So in Acts chapter 15, what happened is these people came in contact with Paul and Barnabas. Because we see that Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. And Paul and Barnabas were so incensed by this that they knew so obviously that this was wrong. They were so certain that this was wrong that they actually disobeyed what Paul himself wrote. Do all things without murmurings or disputing, disputings, disputations. So they had a disputation. People say, oh, see, that was God's will. No, God wants us to preach the gospel, to tell the truth. Paul and Barnabas were supposed to be just telling the truth. They weren't supposed to dispute people who tell falsehoods. There will always be people telling falsehoods. And these people here were telling an absolute heresy, an absolute falsehood. Paul and Barnabas were just supposed to be telling the truth. What are we supposed to do? Go into all the world and preach the good news. What's the good news? That Jesus took the sins of the whole world, so whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. That's the good news. The good news isn't you're wrong and I'm right. No, that's, that's dissension and disputation. Like I said last week, that's never right. That's never God's will. But Paul and Barnabas saw the need, because of their dispute and dissension, they wanted to prove to these certain men that were teaching a heresy, they wanted to prove that they were wrong. Now, the apostles in Jerusalem were looked up to, but they were not needed in the circumstance that actually had no authority over the Gentiles. The church in Jerusalem was the church in Jerusalem. Pastors in, in Jerusalem had no authority over pastors in among the Gentiles. Every believer stands before God alone. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus said, I am the shepherd of the sheep. The sheep hear the shepherd's voice and he calls himself the shepherd. So there is no reason to go to Jerusalem in the first place here. So this dissension and disputation, either Philippians 2, 14 is true or it isn't. If it's not true, then throw out your Bible. It says, do all things. Does it say do some things? It says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. And like I said last week, uh, I gave so much proof of this last week that it's very obvious that God doesn't want us disputing. That disputing do doesn't solve anything. But Paul and Barnabas felt this need because they argued with them. They had to win the argument. So they thought, well, the way we'll win it is we'll go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders. Well, the apostles and elders in Jerusalem were the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. They had no authority over the Gentiles or any other church in any other area. Did you ever see a pastor of one church go into another church and tell everybody what they should do and tell everybody, well, this is how you need to do things and this is what you should believe? No, he has no authority in that other church. No pastor or, or apostle or teacher has any authority in anywhere other than where he is allowed to have authority, where he's given authority. Paul and Barnabas gave the church in Jerusalem the authority to decide this question. Now, this was not up to the, the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. It wasn't up to them. But they went, and when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all the things that God had done with them. But there rose up a certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise people and command them to keep the law of Moses, and the apostles and elders, they came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, now what did it just tell us in Philippians 2.14? Do all things without murmuring or disputing. What happened as a result of Paul and Barnabas going to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem about this question because of their dispute? 
Their dispute caused them to do this, and what happened as a result? More disputing. Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bore witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. How were their hearts purified? By faith. Now, everyone knew this. This was the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was preaching. But Peter reiterates it here, and he says, Now, therefore, why tempt you God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now, here Peter is pointing out the obvious. No one was able to live up to the law. No one ever lived up to the law. And it was a yoke which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. So he's pointing out the obvious here. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So here he's pointing out the obvious, that both Jews and Gentiles are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved by his sacrifice, by his blood. And then all the multitude kept silence as Barnabas and Paul declared the miracles and wonders which God had wrought among the Gentiles by them without going to the church in Jerusalem. God was already working among them and they were preaching the good news like they were supposed to and the Gentiles were believing it. And after they had held their peace, James answered. Now James was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he said, men and brethren, hearken unto me. Peter has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles and take out of them a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this. Now I'm going to read this out of the NIV because Verse 19 is hard to understand in the King James, but it basically says the same thing. Verse 19, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, hold on a second. This whole disputation thing brought about a judgment by James, who had no authority to give this judgment in the first place, that he should not make it difficult for the Gentiles. Hold on a second. How can James make it difficult for the Gentiles in the first place? He can't. It's by the grace of Jesus. The same grace that saved James saved the Gentiles. They're saved by the same blood of Jesus Christ that James was saved by. How can he make it difficult for the Gentiles when he has no authority over them? So here we see in verse 19, James is just totally outside of the box here. He's saying, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult. He can't make it difficult for the Gentiles. He can't do that. But he's saying, well, we should not as if he has authority to do this, we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, thank God this is a correct judgment, at least, that no, he shouldn't make it difficult for the Gentiles, but he had no right to in the first place. This was all brought about because of the, this dispute, this dispute that was never should have brought, been brought up in the first place. If they would have just kept preaching the truth, the gospel would have continued to go out. And so this judgment didn't make any difference whatsoever. But he said, said, it's my judgment. We should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them, hold on a second. Once again, they have no authority to tell them anything. But once again, they've taken this upon themselves. It was brought to them by Paul and Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas were kind of indirectly giving them the authority to make this judgment, even though they didn't have the authority to make it. So here James says, instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat strangled, of strangled animals, and from blood. Hold on a second. Does the Bible say this anywhere? I'm not arguing against abstaining from uh, food polluted by idols or from sexual immorality or from meat strangled, of strangled animals and from blood. I'm not arguing these points, but these are not true statements. This is not something that is true for anyone. This is not anything Jesus taught us. He didn't teach us to abstain from, from food polluted by idols, from, from the meat of strangled animals, or from blood. John, one of the disciples of Jesus, tells us what God's commands are. This is God's command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Now, is there any other commands here? No. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. What commands is he talking about? To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he commanded us. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know by the spirit he gave us. In other words, you're saved by being born again. And of course, we know that, know that from numerous places in the Bible. 
But this just tells you how ridiculous this judgment is in Acts chapter 15, where James is saying he's adding on some commandments here that God never gave the Gentiles. He didn't tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols. And Jesus himself told us food doesn't make you unclean. So abstaining from food polluted by idols doesn't make any difference whatsoever. The commandments of God are plainly told to us in 1 John chapter 3. They are written to us by John, one of the apostles. He tells us exactly what the commandments of God are. This is God's commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So here we see Acts chapter 15. This dispute has brought about just absolute ridiculous results. James is saying we should write to these Gentiles and tell them to abstain from pollutions of idols and from and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Well, yeah, okay, I'm not going to argue for fornication. I'm not arguing for that. But none of these other things make any difference, and fornication doesn't decide whether you're saved or not. People are condemned because they have not believed in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what John 3.18 tells us. That's the judgment of God. The law was canceled by Jesus at the cross. God nailed the law to the cross with Christ. It was done away with. The old covenant is no longer in place. These limitations that are being added on by James are not true. And they wrote letters to them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren, which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have learned that certain men went out from us and have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. Now, if they would have left it here, this would have been a great letter, because this is all great. This is this is the truth. They were saying, hey, you know what? These people were telling a false heresy. They were saying you must be circumcised, and you didn't have to be circumcised. So being circumcised is keeping the law, and being circumcised and keeping the law is not something they were required to do, and they're pointing that out. The Jewish believers are pointing this out to the Gentiles. If they would have stopped here, it would have been all good. And they say in verse 28, It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. (laughs) Oh, dear Lord. First of all, they had no authority to write this letter in the first place. And now they're saying that they are going to put a burden no greater burden than this. In other words, we're going to lay a burden upon you, but no greater burden than this. And these are necessary things. Oh, is that right? How come we're told what the commandments of God are? To believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And here they're saying, well, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. Well, basically they're saying it's it's to us. And they're, they're putting the Holy Ghost on this. And the Holy Ghost, hey, the Holy Ghost is behind the scriptures. All scriptures are... God breathed. In other words, the Holy Ghost is behind the scriptures. The scriptures say we should believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. And here we see that these people, this is just a circumstance, a correct rendering of what happened. This is not a command from God. This is not God telling us that this is the truth. This is a correct story telling what actually happened in the early church. This is the Jews in Jerusalem making a statement that they actually did make that wasn't true. But we have a correct account of it. The Bible gives a correct account. Throughout this whole book, you'll see that this was all a correct account. It tells exactly what happened. And it doesn't say whether it was right or wrong. It just says this is what happened. They tell us it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and us. So they're they're putting this on God. They're saying, oh yeah, the Holy Ghost. But it's really them. Because we know that the the scriptures, which are God-breathed, disagree with them on this. So they're saying, It seemed good to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Now, we know these are not necessary things. We know the two things that are necessary are to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Those are what the commands are of God. And what saves you is believing in Jesus Christ. That's what saves you. Those who believe in Jesus are not condemned. Those who don't believe are condemned because they have not believed. That means believing in Jesus is what's necessary. So here they add on some other stuff. They say that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood, and from things strangled. Oh, well, hold on a second. All three of those things are not true. But this is a correct rendering of the letter that was written by the Jews in Jerusalem. They did write this letter, and the Bible records what they wrote. They wrote that they needed to abstain from this all this stuff about food, which didn't matter. What goes into your body is not what makes you unclean, according to Jesus. It's what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. But then they say, and from fornication, 
Now, fornication is not a good thing. They could have said, and from killing too, and from, from stealing. They could have said all the Ten Commandments here. They didn't have to say just from fornication. They could have said, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't break any of the other Ten Commandments either. Because none of those, it's not right to break any of the Ten Commandments. That's not right to do any of those things. They could have said any of those. So they say fornication. Well, the truth is the commandments of God don't include any of these four things. They don't include any of these. The commands of God are to love one another. And if you love someone, you're not going to do things that are break the Ten Commandments. So breaking the Ten Commandments are all things that proceed from not loving people. Jesus said if you love one another, you're keeping all the commandments. You're keeping the commandments by loving one another. And that's what Jesus told us to do is love one another. So they wrote these letters and they went to Antioch and when they gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. In other words, being under the burden of the law was a burden. It was a yoke, just like Peter said. It's a yoke that neither him nor his forefathers could bear. It was a yoke. So it was a consolation that they didn't have to be under the law. So here we see God working it together for good. A disputation that resulted in more disputation and that resulted in a judgment that would, could not be made by people who didn't have the authority to make it. It all resulted in good. They rejoiced for the consolation. There was good that came out of this. God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The people were consoled. They were consoled by the, the message that, hey, we're not under the law. Thank God. We don't have to be circumcised. We don't have to go over the, all the commandments of the law and try to figure out all of them and obey them. All. No, you don't. You have to love one another. So here we see God working it together for good. This wasn't a resolution of any sort. Remember, Paul and Barnabas were already preaching the good news that if you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. They were, that's what they were preaching. The only reason they brought this to the church in Jerusalem was because they got in a dispute with people preaching false doctrines. Something you're not supposed to do in the first place. People who preach false doctrines, you know, if people listen to them, they're going to bear the result of listening to false doctrines. But if they hear the truth, they'll be saved. If they believe the truth, they'll be saved. That's true regardless. There were still people that would listen to these people preaching false doctrines. And in fact, in the church today, there are still people who believe this false doctrine that people have to be under the law, that Christians are, that Gentiles or Christians are under the law. No, they're not. The law is canceled, period, the end. We're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. And we're saved by confessing Jesus as Lord and believing in our heart, God raised him for the dead and being born again. We're saved by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, according to Titus 3, 5. And then even later on in, in Acts chapter 15, we see another dispute it says, starting at verse 35, Paul and Barnabas continued to Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go again and visit the brethren in every city where we preach the word and see how they're doing. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. Oh, hold on a second. We're supposed to do all things without disputations. The contention, the disputation was so sharp that they parted ways. Do you think it was God's will? But they departed from one another. God worked it together for good. What happened as a result of this? Well, Barnabas took Mark. Barnabas was... Being merciful to Mark, something Paul was not able to do. Barnabas, he gave Mark a second chance and he sailed to Cyprus and he preached the gospel there. Hey, this resulted in more gospel being preached because Paul chose Silas and departed and was commended by the brethren under the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. So here we see that they went in two different directions and these were men of God preaching the gospel and it actually was worked together for good. It was more people that got to hear the word of God and more churches that got to be confirmed because Barnabas and Paul parted ways. Now, was it God's will that they come into this sharp contention between each other? No. The Bible says, do all things without disputations. The Bible says do all things without disputations or murmurings. All, all things. 
It doesn't say some things. It says all things. See, when people do things with murmurings and disputings, God can still work it together for good. That's what God does. God's in the business of working things together for good. Why? Because we screw up all the time. People are not perfect. We make mistakes. Remember the Apostle Paul said in, in Romans chapter 7, he said, I don't do the good things I want to do. Paul couldn't see all the good he was doing because he just saw the bad he was doing. And he was saying, you know, I don't do the good things I want to do. Hey, this is true of everyone. Every Christian falls short. No one does everything right. That's why God works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Those who love God and are called according to his purpose have the gospel on their lips. They have the good news on their lips. God is promoting the gospel. God wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And he's going to do all things for good. He's going to work all things for good for those people to make sure the gospel goes out. God wasn't behind the disputation that was in Acts chapter 15. He wasn't behind the second one either that separated Barnabas and Paul. Well, he wasn't behind that either, but he worked it together for good. I will stand behind what I said last week, and I'm not going to take it back, and you can't convince me that that's wrong. What you can convince me of is that people are not perfect. No, they're not. People make mistakes. And because of that, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So that's my message for today. Thanks for watching.